actually talk for real. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here today uh, for our annual Political Geography Plenary Lecture. Uh, my name is Kevin Grove. I'm a geographer at Florida National University and editor in chief at Political Geography. 2022 marks the journal's 40th anniversary, and since 1982, the journal sought to promote research that refines and develops what the scope of political geography can be, while also building bridges to research in related disciplines and subfields of geography. 40 years ago, environmental issues hardly registered within political geographic scholarship. But the collapse of the Cold War, the emergence of non-traditional environmental security concerns, and more recently, growing recognition that anthropogenic climate change is already producing geographically uneven impacts, has brought these issues to the forefront of the field. At the same time, the advent of the Anthropocene has also challenged dominant conceptual imaginaries, analytical approaches, and epistemological resources, particularly as we grapple <clears throat> with the way that chattel slavery, white supremacy, and colonial violence continue to shape everyday experiences of vulnerability, insecurity, and resistance to conditions of forced environmental destruction and deprivation. These challenges are thus ethical and political, as well as conceptual and epistemological. And they present the political geographic community with new imperatives to continue building bridges with other fields of geographic scholarship. Our plenary speaker today, Dr. Farhana Sultana, is one of the most dynamic interdisciplinary scholars working on these topics today. A professor in the Department of Geography and the Environment at Syracuse University, Dr. Sultana's research focuses broadly on water governance, climate justice, political ecology, critical development studies, transnational feminist theories, critical urban studies, social justice, human rights, citizenship, decolonizing, and South Asia. Beyond her 70 plus publications, Dr. Sultana is also reinventing what it means to be a public scholar, engaging in the kinds of transdisciplinary research activities that connect critical geographic scholarship with communities of practice in creative and impactful ways. In this way, her work exemplifies for all geographers what critical and engaged geographic research in the Anthropocene can become. So today, Dr. Sultana will be talking on the unbearable heaviness of climate coloniality. We're also happy to be joined by our three respondents, Dr. Jennifer Rice of the University of Georgia, Dr. DeAndre, DeAndre Smiles of the University of Victoria, and Dr. Meredith DeBoom of the University of South Carolina. And they'll show their remarks after Dr. Sultana's talk. So please join me in welcoming our 2022 AAG Political Geography Plenary Speaker, Dr. Farhana Sultana. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just share my slide just uh, really quickly. Hopefully it'll work. Somebody tell me if you can see that. <laughs> yes, it works. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Kevin, for the very generous and wonderful invitation to deliver the 2022 AAG Political Geography Plenary Lecture, and also for that uh, marvelous introduction. I had no idea I did such amazing things, but I like hearing about it. <laughs> and to my interlocutors, uh, DeAndre, Meredith, and Jennifer in today's panel, I'm very grateful that you're here with me today. I meant to everyone in the audience, uh, thank you for making time on a Friday afternoon. So today's talk, uh, just to give a little bit of context, is part of ongoing wider work, um, and the work is very much in progress. And the written paper is about twice as long as what I'll be delivering today. So I'll only be covering parts of it, but it, it is forthcoming in the journal of Political Geography, so you'll definitely have access to it soon. So my primary goals today are the same as the much longer paper, which is to understand climate coloniality that is theorized and grounded in lived experiences. So when we think about climate coloniality, you know, I want to start with two vignettes. So in a speech that went viral at the opening summit of the COP26, which it, or the 26th meeting of the Conference of Parties on Climate, the Prime Minister of Barbados argued, quote, we do not want that dreaded death sentence. We have come here today to say, try harder, end quote. After a two year hiatus due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the necessity to halt climate breakdown was fervently clamored for at the global conference in late 2021. Yet a dismal to, uh, COP26 led indigenous and environmental activists to call various climate solutions to be false and a form of perpetuating colonialism through land grabs, extraction, displacement, and co-optation. Bolivian president echoed such concerns about climate offsetting and the imposition of rules from powerful countries on the historically marginalized countries through the UN system and other mechanisms to be the new carbon colonialism, whereby 
post-colonial countries are marginalized in international negotiations, and power matrices of control are exerted over narratives on climate change. A parallel people summit for climate justice held just outside of the COP26 venue made insistent demands for systems change. Youth climate activists rallied under the banner of no more blah, blah, blah to criticize failures and unkempt promises by world leaders. Rhetorical critiques of empty promises were backed up with examples of real world politics of delays, denials, deflections, and dispossessions. From heads of state to local activists, Colonial tactics were identified and openly called out during and after the COP26. As many dejected climate activists, delegates, and youth from the Global South left the conference, a clear sense of injustice and climate delay was articulated by many, expressing grief, anger, sadness, rage, and futility. This rage was deemed righteous in the claims by historically oppressed countries for justice, reparations, and equity over several preceding COPs, so it wasn't new. But the, now the rage has gone global, yet it is not equivalent everywhere nor experienced in the same registers. The COP26 can be seen as one of the theaters of climate colonialism, led mainly by corporations, powerful governments, and elites, yet simultaneously as a site of decolonial, anti-colonial, anti-racist, and feminist politics, led primarily by activists, youth, indigenous groups, academics, and unions. International climate negotiations falter in addressing climate change without meaningfully reducing fossil fuel dependency, growth models, and hyperconsumption, along with the very systems that undergird these across scales. The global theaters of climate negotiations showcase the politics and the political, whether subaltern or suburban, where there are both reifications and ruptures in what politics is and what constitutes its, its pathways. Sense of despair, suffocation, stagnation, and abandonment and, pro, and regression coexist with that of potentiality, alternative possibilities, collectivizing, world-making, and critical hope. As I closely followed the COP26 events, I recalled an entry I'd written many years ago as a student. I reproduced parts of it here, despite how scattered the thoughts may be from back then, written by a very young me trying to make sense of the events around her. I share it mainly for the haunting of the words today, how it resonates with contemporary climate politics and reflecting how the personal is always political. In other words, a personal account of the unruly mix of embodied emotions, signals, the collective affective registers of contemporary climate politics discussed above. Amar Sposhtu Moneate, I clearly remember that night in 1991 when a massive tropical cyclone barreled into Desh. Desh is the shortened version of Bangladesh or what we call it back home. How the sound of the storm, the trees churning and buildings shaking scared me throughout the night. I was terrified by the deafening sounds across the land and of howling winds outside that battered everything, knowing instinctively that a disaster was unfolding. News broke the next day of the devastation where a 20 foot tall sea surge killed thousands overnight. Later, we would learn it was up to 150,000 people. So many people just stolen by the sea. A gamut of grief, worry, and guilt filled me that day and subsequent days as I read newspapers and looked at images in our small TV of utter devastation, flattened homes and trees, floating carcasses of humans and livestock alike. Most of this country is at sea level, so the water just rushed in and took everything away. Amar shopki chushesh, keu nei. I have lost everything, everyone, cried a woman whose entire family and homestead were swept away and she barely managed to survive by clinging to a tree for days. So much destruction, devastation, and suffering. My immediate family was fortunate as our home was in the floodplains a little further inland from the main sites of devastation along the coast. But we worried about my ancestral home nearer the coast and our extended family there, of my elderly grandparents and relatives who lived in traditional homes made of wood, bamboo, and clay in villages deep in the Delta marshes of the Bengal Delta, one of the world's largest deltas formed by two of the world's most powerful rivers, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. Amra Matir Manush, Poli Mati Teshikor, Kintar Amar Paplabun Bhumi, Nodi Rebung Jawar Bhatar Deshiro Manush. We are people of the soil rooted in the fertile delta, a people of floodplains crisscrossed by rivers in a land of tidal waves.
Tidal rhythms rule everything, and flooding is an annual occurrence during the monsoon season, but devastating cyclones and sea surges were less common. No phones, electricity, or paved roads to the villages existed back then, so we didn't know how our family was for many days. Coastal communities were historically protected by the Sundarban mangrove forest, but increasingly subjected to tropical cyclone damage and destruction with deforestation. But in coastal villages and towns to the east of the Sundarban forest, there is no natural protection from the wrath of nature. So I kept worrying, the cyclones are coming, killing all. I was frustrated with thoughts of what our government was going to do, what the global powerful would do. I felt like both the government and the global community didn't do enough to reduce vulnerabilities and risks. Man-made global warming is already upon us. Scholars, journalists, activists, politicians in Desh are already talking about climate change since we were feeling the impacts already. Indeed, our nation state was, state was birthed only in 1971 in the wake of a massive tropical cyclone of 1970 that sparked a hard-won deadly independence war where a devastating storm became a politically galvanizing force. But that's another story for another time. So I constantly worry what happens to those who are drowned out from more powerful storms and surges, whose water sources are increasingly salinized from rising seas and encroaching seawater, whose land is disappearing from erosion. Where do people take this collective grief, anger, and trauma? Where will my people go? What future do we have? Must we remain abandoned and forsaken? The disproportionate burden of climate change is falling on formerly colonized and brutalized racialized communities in the developing world. We are still colonized, but this time through climate change, the development industry and globalization. I feel an immense responsibility to do something, but no one's going to listen to somebody like me. But more importantly, more marginalized peoples, the women, the children, the fishermen and farmers, the writers, the scholars. But we're expected to be resilient because we have no choice. What empty words resiliency and recovery feel like. Such hollowness, so much sor sorrow. <laughs> This emptiness feels heavy. End quote. <laughs> I am critically self-reflexive of my geopolitical and intersectional locations as I reproduce part of this vignette as a form of unorganized testimonial that bears witness to history and coloniality. I do not share it for victimhood or damaged narrative, but one of situated knowledge and visceral response to one of the deadliest tropical disasters of the time, one that ushered in a political conscientization of and planted the seeds towards theorizing climate coloniality through lived experiences. I realize now that I was already writing and thinking decades ago along the lines of what is far better articulated and theorized in the contemporary moment. As I observed the events unfolding at the COP26, I ruefully recalled the century from years ago for the similarities and resonances across the decadal, spatial, and social registers to what is being said now. Years later, I would read Franz Fanon, realizing that I was perhaps articulating that to be, to be colonized is to be made to feel less than, to be told what the truths are, to be valued differently over time and place, a dehumanization through an epidermalization of inferiority and being created as racialized other. The colonial wound is embodied. It is engraved in bodies and minds. Structural racism structures the world in unequal ways through colonial and imperial violence, both material and epistemological. Fanon gives us tools to think with from embodied experiences of climate and colonialism, of geopolitical epistemology and material reality. The spatialization of colonialism's racism and environmental destruction go hand in hand. Climate coloniality reproduces the hauntings of colonialism and imperialism through climate change in the post-colony, which is primarily located in the tropics and subtropics where climate-induced disasters and shifts have been prevalent for some time across places in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Climate change lays bare the colonialism of not only the past, but an ongoing coloniality that governs and structures our lives, where, which are co-constitutive of processes of capitalism, imperialism, and international development. The uneven and unequal vulnerabilities and marginalizations of deaths and devastation taken for granted draw attention to continuities from the past and into the future. It is a slow violence. In this paper, I wanted to start 
by feeling with climate change, to explore the heaviness of it as it insidiously seeps into everyday aspects of life, the erosions it propels, the suffocations it creates, the intergenerational traumas that remain. The ennui of coloniality creates sensories of being and not being, of belonging and not belonging, of deficiency and capaciousness, of giving in and resisting. I want to account for the fleshiness of climate, the past and presence in our bodies, minds, soils, and kin, where the theory is in the flesh and struggles form the basis of political consciousness and oppositional epistemologies against oppression in shared worlds, as Sherry Moraga and Gloria Anzaldua have argued, or as the late Bell Hooks poignantly articulated, quote, marginality as more than a site of deprivation, it is also a site of radical possibility, a space of resistance, end quote. In some ways, this is perhaps border thinking, or thinking from the borderlands that are oppressed by the colonial matrix of power, but nonetheless resisted, where knowledge can be produced outside of modernity, but in relation to it and decolonial scholarship. Alternative epistemologies and cosmologies emerge from lived experiences that were and are devalued in Eurocentric modernity and climate coloniality. This requires addressing both epistemic violences and material outcomes that I do in this paper. By weaving through such mediations, I offer an understanding of climate coloniality that is theorized and ground in lived experiences. I demonstrate that confronting climate coloniality also in involves reconstituting individual and collective memories and consciousness for reconciliation and liberation. Part of this is accounting for the embodied emotional geographies of climate coloniality. Briefly put, coloniality in lived experiences expresses the complexities of coloniality of power and the ongoing and enduring assaults of colonialism through modernity, capitalism, neocolonialism, imperialism, and international development. As theorized by Anibal Quijano and Walter Mignolo, coloniality relies on racial domination and hierarchical power relations established during active colonialism and ongoing in post-colonial space times where the colonial matrix of power persists. Thus, coloniality occurs where Eurocentric hegemony, neocolonialism, racial capitalism, uneven consumption, and military domination are co-constitutive of climate impacts experienced by variously racialized populations who are disproportionately made vulnerable and disposable. The racial disposability of both those experiencing climate devastation in their homelands and those displaced as climate migrants and refugees demonstrate further the curtailing of self-determination and futurities. Ongoing climate coloniality is expressed through insidious racisms globally and continuing othering as theorized by Albert Said. Also through the dispossessions through colonial capitalist extra extractivism and commodification, rapacious displacement and destruction, creation of sacrifice zones, and disproportionate exposures to harms from climate-induced disasters. Historical differences position colonial and imperial countries overall at greater advantages over post-colonial and presently occupied countries. Colonial logical, logics of extractivism continues through neocolonial and development interventions post-World War II. The unequal ecological exchange between the global North and South, ongoing ex extractive capitalism, and imperial structures of global trade and domination and policies and ideologies all work to maintain climate coloniality. I use Global North and Global South as analytical categories, but also geographical spaces marked by heterogeneity and historical differences. Scholars have quantified the unequal ecological exchange, calling it the ongoing colonial plunder of resources from the Global South to the Global North, one that contributes to the overdevelopment of the latter at the expense of the former. Such processes continue various uh, colonial patterns of harm and dispossession. It has been argued that the global north owes the global south a climate debt due to climate coloniality and the ever, excre extreme, uh, ever increasing colonization of the atmosphere. Legacies of imperial violence live on through not only exacerbated environmental degradations, but increasing climate-induced disasters. As frequencies and strengths of climate-fueled natural hazards, such as tropical cyclones, grow, the structural violences of colonialism are felt further 
corporeally, communally, politically, economically, and ecologically. Slow but compounding violence exacerbates vulnerabilities that maintain climate coloniality and extend it into the future. The racial logic of climate tragedies and cumulative impacts is ever present. The undifferentiated humanity that is assumed in persistent narratives of the Anthropocene does not exist. Coloniality is expressed through continued ecolo ecological degradation that are both overt and covert, episodic and creeping, whereby global capitalism articulates with development and economic growth ideologies to reproduce various forms of colonial racial harms to entire countries in the global south and communities of color in the global north. Climate coloniality is perpetuated through global land and water grabs, deforestation for growth, fossil fuel warfare, Green, uh, new green revolutions for agriculture, rare earth, rare earth mineral mining, and carbon offsetting programs for the wealthy that are dispossessing the historically impoverished elsewhere. Interventions are called by various names and have different tenors, such as green colonialism, carbon colonialism, and fossil capitalism, but often with similar outcomes of domination, displacement, degradation, and impoverishment, extractivism propagated by global capital and state sanctioned interventions perpetuates geopolitical climate necropolitics within and beyond borders. Yet after decades of evidence on ex escalating climate impacts, there has been little mitigation in reducing greenhouse gas emissions everywhere. Climate apartheid is how some have called the socio-spatial differentiation and who pays the disproportionate price of climate breakdown and are thereby made ex expendable and those who are spared for now. There are complex forms of abjection, precarity, uncertainty, exhaustion, and trauma among those deemed disposable. At the same time, it becomes imperative to recognize the differential intersectionalities within communities and how harms can be reproduced at different scales. Co-production of racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and imperialism con uh, continue in different ways, often supported by local elites and community members who can be complicit. The confluence of local power imbalances, uneven creation of vulnerabilities and production of risk end up merging global climate breakdown with scalar intersectional fa uh, factors from the planetary to the body, thereby creating more complex tapestries of outcomes in different contexts. Ultimately, coloniality discursively limits the terms of the debate, hegemonizes knowledge of and about climate change, and what actions are possible, thereby destroying other epistemologies. Hierarchical power relations and knowledge production are maintained in the enduring colonial matrix of power. Cognitive coloniality is maintained in the colonization of the mind in terms of what is known, knowable, and what has valence. This coexists with epistemic violence in knowledge production and valuation of expertise. Since Eurocentrism, internalized racism, and colonialism, this system of power is hegemonic globally now in how climate is talked about, the planning that is pursued, and the dominant education around it. A lack of cognitive justice and epistemic decolonization is perpetuated in the reinforcement of climate coloniality, along with the hegemonization of narratives, epistemologies, and imagined climate solutions. There is thus an urgent need to decolonize climate. Epistemology and materiality simultaneously are central to decolonization. In other words, both knowledge production and epistemological framings, but also engaging with praxis of material outcomes and lived experiences. For instance, related to fossil fuel capitalism, neoliberal development paradigms, end endless growth ideologies, maldistribution of material well being, and so on. To decolonize climate at a basic level is to integrate more decolonial, anti colonial feminist, anti-racist, and anti-capitalist critiques and struggles into mainstream climate discourses and practices to redress ongoing oppressions and marginalizations. Fundamentally, though, decolonization necessitates the critical interrogations of complexities of empire, imperialism, and capitalism, and then how to decenter them and dismantle them. It also confronts and addresses material outcomes of framings and reframings, internalizing a material praxis that takes co-production seriously. It is not just about recognizing the problems, but working towards distributive justice, reparations, and restitution. However, unresponsive 
unreflexive celebration of transformative potential does no one any favors, it would be impossible to deny the conformity and uniformity the development and capitalism tries to systemically and rapaciously instill everywhere, or how capitalism reinvents itself through the crises it produces, both materially and discursively. The shrinking spaces of being otherwise and doing differently need to be acknowledged Still, it is increasingly evident that maintaining racial and class privileges at the global scale is impossible in decolonizing climate justice. This is one of the tasks at hand. Liberation comes from destroying colonialism's impacts on lands, bodies, and psyches to overcome the apocalypse and that continues to be coloniality or borrowing from Fanon, moving from alienation and dehumanization to self-realization in order to decolonize climate uh, to decolonize colonial traumas healing the colonial wounds through transformative care empathy mutuality and love hold possibilities we desperately need to heal colonial wounds everywhere to achieve this concerted work is needed on both the material and political and the discursive and epistemological while recognizing how these are but analytical categories for discussion and are intricately intertwined in everyday life in socio-spatial ways. I parse these out now before bringing them together towards the end. I want to turn to the global scale for a moment to consider why there are persistent challenges to decolonizing climate governance ideologies and practices. Structural changes are necessary in international governance for equitable recognition and distributive justice to occur and between countries, but achieving this is really challenging. While desiring for transforming inequitable and exploitative systems are reiterated by different constituents and countries, for instance, seen at the COPs and elsewhere, it remains elusive still. This is because contemporary governance systems are undergirded by centuries of colonial and imperial power struggles and ideologies, whereby now a global network of nation states, corporations, and elites dominate discursive framings around climate and the material outcomes therein. Thus, challenges to and changes in the system are resisted from within and without. Opposition to empire dying is manifested in the resistance to shared governance, accountability, and giving up control, as this results in loss of existing and future power and material wealth. Nonetheless, different material solutions and outcomes have been imagined and, and, and insisted upon. Thus far, demands have been made of death cancellation as part of climate reparations to countries of the global south who have historically been impoverished and indentured through colonial and imperial finance mechanisms and capitalist extractivism fueled by neoliberal global trade. The debates around climate reparations remain contentious, though, as loss and damage acknowledgement has not been followed through with sufficient financial or material support. But reparations are more than just finance. It's about supporting world making and material changes that account for the histories of slavery, colonialism and imperialism everywhere. In addition to decolonizing climate, would all, it would also address thinking about how we um, address various institutions at multiple scales beyond just the global. So for instance, one would be the role of the state where it sits vis-a-vis -vis the rise of mutual aid, calls for agroecological sovereignty, energy self-sufficiency, anti-capitalist and anti-neoliberal development models. Decolonizing climate is largely meaningless if it does not come with measurable shifts in laws, policies, institutional frameworks, or material redistributions. The material outcomes are ultimately adjudicated, governed, and filtered through co-constitutive processes that need collaborative work and sharing of power publicly accountable funding, technologies, and policies with requisite transformations of public institutions and capacities become central to this across the post-colonial and, and occupied worlds. Furthermore, the role of international development institutions and donor funding come under critical consideration as development can and has perpetuated various forms of neocolonial neo controls over the post-colonial and occupied worlds through the operations of both state and non-state organizations and through co cognitive conditioning of citizens and institutions. Development has material and ideological components through which coloniality is enacted and reproduced in capitalist colonial renditions. This occurs through the creation and promotion of desires of Western style hyperconsumption in development models across the global South. 
It repeats colonialities of imperial violence through development logics, finance, geopolitics of debt, and Western educational hegemonization. Education that continues Eurocentric models of knowledge production, circulation, and pedagogy also reify coloniality and colonization of the mind as development subjects and citizens are created every day around the world. In confronting climate coloniality, the need thereby rises of being mindful of the goal of not just undoing centuries of harm and ongoing devastations through policies, finance, interventions, and media that are insidious in everyday life, but also rebuilding and reconstituting in different ways, in more capacious and equitable ways. Scalar geographic analyses and critiques are essential both in confronting cr crises and in imagining co-created solutions. A reworking of relationships become necessary across geopolitical scales and also in human non-human relationships. Valuing indigenous and traditional knowledge and science worldwide is essential to this. For instance, indigenous work in the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Palestine point to the ways that internal colonization has been resisted in settler colonial contexts, offering insights into border crossings for abolition justice. These are by no means the only examples, since anti-colonial movements across Asia, Africa, and Latin America are replete with struggles and reconstitutions. By resisting and calling for abolition of fossil fuel dependency, indigenous groups worldwide have demanded a restructuring of not only the current geopolitical orders, but relations to the earth and from which fossil fuels are extracted. These are linked to ongoing global indigenous and peasant led resistances against various types of extractive exploitative practices. Throughout history, such endeavors have not only been ignored, silenced and resisted, but often violently oppressed and erased. Nevertheless, they persist. What is evident thus is an urgent need for solidarities across front lines for decolonization, reformulation of institutions and power matrices across scales, alongside geopolitical shifts in advancing the valuation of a livable planet for all. This includes epistemic decolonization and recommitment to collective action that crosses borders and boundaries. In conjunction with the material injustices, securitization of profit, and geopolitical planetary control, addressing discursive and material climate coloniality becomes important. Imperialism is underpinned by colonial forms of racialization and race science, devaluing othered knowledges and expert voices from marginalized populations, often undergirded by Orientalism. This raises the urgency to decolonize knowledge production on climate change. The same talking heads, often global north, white male experts, tend to dominate climate conversations rather than those experiencing long-standing climate devastation or producing place-based knowledge. Whitewashing of climate discourses and intellectual spaces is increasingly being critiqued, however. Thus, decolonizing climate is very much about knowledge production in terms of who is cited, which epistemologies, whose ontologies, and so on, but also who is invited to speak, who is heard, and who helps set agendas. It is not just about having a seat at the table, for instance, participating at the COP26, but determining what the very table is. In other words, the terms of the debate or framing of the conversation, and then having actual decision-making powers. Ultimately, it is a shifting of the critical geopolitics of knowledge production, as well as reevaluating expertise and experts. For instance, narratives of a coming up climate apocalypse or dystopian futures, which are popular in hegemonic climate narratives and in the media, are not futurity for all, but already a past and present of colonized people of color everywhere. Yet clom common climate narratives are often about white futures that defuture racialized others, which reinforces white supremacy at the global scale. Climate coloniality is thus perpetuated through mundane and institutionalized ways of subalternization of non-Eurocentric, non-masculinist, and non-capitalistic understandings of climate, ecology, and nature-society relations. As a result, decolonizing educational systems are fundamental, as this is where systemic cognitive injustices often began through former formal westernized education about climate that has gone global. Epistemic violence and colonization of the 
the mind need to be acknowledged and undone across universities, training centers, non-governmental organizations, and state institutions. At the same time, it is an understanding of our own complicities and perpetuating harms and actively working to redress it through everyday praxis and re-education. Similarly, concepts of ecocide and epistemicide further clarify how knowledges were erased and devalued, but need recovering and reconstituting. The decolonization of the mind re uh, remains critical for epistemic justice and pluriverse, where recuperation of collective memory and cultural practices to foster conviviality are important in order to overcome the colonial matrix of power. Deconstructing climate coloniality allows for understanding of how climate change continues to condition the material realities and discourses not only around nature society relationships, but also the epistemic violences that follow in its wake. It is an undoing of this that is at stake and then the remaking of futures not haunted by the past and present. Therefore, while climate coloniality temporally and spatially causes eroding and erasure, there are also fissures that rupture through its weight, resist its imposition, and rework it. Multiple forms of knowledges may be ex excluded in hegemonic climate discourses and practices, but are valuable cosmologies of decolonial knowledge and resistance that center accountable, reciprocal, and ethical relations and processes. For instance, defending territorial ontologies as decolonial politics, blockades, resistance, movements, and land back claims are community claims building for liberatory praxis. Speaking in one's native tongue, collective memory and culture rebuilding, retelling historiographies, and celebration of human non-human kinship are but some of the strategies. Native singing and dancing are acts of resistance and counter stories and counter mapping are strategies of opposition. Valuing storytelling is decolonial climate action and reclaiming sacredness is anti-colonial. Recognizing relational entanglements and healing foster well-being and convivialities as theorized by Arturo Escobar. To celebrate resurgence in cultural practices of art, literature, oral tradition, poetry, and dance is to reclaim agency, desire, futurity, and spirit. These examples are simultaneously coping mechanisms, refusals, and decolonial actions. However, it is vital not to fetishize prehistories as frozen time or culture as magical solutions to systemic oppression, but recognize how they propel further decolonization and revolutionary resistance. These foster fleshing out theories and grounding concepts. It is an affirmation of the humanity of the oppressed and of fostering radical equality. In other words, the agency and corporeality of the colonized come to matter. The realities and concerns of those caught up in epistemic entanglements and friction need to be worked through cer certainly where reconciling may not be entirely possible and differences can coexist. That is the point of pluriversality instead of universality. It is to make visible and draw attention to knowledges and lived experiences to ground theory in places geographically and ontologically. This involves value, valuing transgressive oppositional grays from with those within it exists. It insists upon not just engaging with scholarship and bearing witness to harm, but accepting on their own terms, the lived experiences and testimonials of self and family members of kin and ancestors among those subjected to coloniality. This process validates and give agent, gives agency to the enunciating embodied and knowing subjects whose lived experiences, praxis, and cosmologies matter. It involves deep listening through the roars and whispers and silences that exist. Through such processes, ethics of care, care networks, and prioritizing collective well-being instead of only individual well-being become more clarified. It accounts for the embodied ecological, economic, and political safety from harm and fosters flourishing. Healing the colonial wound through transgressive love and solidarity become possible. Alienation is fought against with reclaiming sacredness and relationalities and moving towards liberation, self-determination. There is increasing recognition that resurgence and renewal are possible seeded through the fertile grounds of the colonial wound to move beyond its conscription towards strategies of revival. As Fanon reminds us, we need to dismantle colonial oppressive institutions and apparatuses for to, true liberation 
collect collective liberation, not just emancipation, is thus necessary. What is evident is that political liberation from climate coloniality will rely on allyship and solidarities in intentional anti-colonial projects across peoples of occupied, post-colonial and settle, settler colonial contexts, particularly among Black, Indigenous, and people of color across continents. Political consciousness informed by an anti-colonial politics is necessary for decolonization and abolition. Kinship building can be fraught. It needs humility and humanity, overcoming alienation, acknowledging differences and commonalities to build shared goals. The worlds we inhabit are full of complicity, compromise, and contradictions, of maintaining white supremacy and racial capitalism, and of moves to innocence and guilt. Collective endeavors are arrived at through working in intentional, concerted, and reflexive ways to address such concerns. This is challenging, but it is necessary work. Decolonization thus must build political community and practical solidarities that foster pluriversality and reparative relations and restore humanity and agency in the battle against climate change. The ruthless extractions and dispossessions from across territories showcase the connections across place-based materialities to broader extractive ideologies and colonial capitalist greed. In other words, it is a decolonization that is not some uncritical celebration of transnational solidarity devoid of material politics of, or intersectional analysis. Ultimately, there is no singular blueprint for decolonizing climate, as decolonization is a process and not an event. It is in the many acts, small and large, acting in constellations and in collectives over time and place that bear a result. So in conclusion, colonialism haunts the present, the past, the future through climate. Imperialism continues through neocolonialism, racial capitalism, development interventions, education, training, and the media. Climate coloniality is expressed in various forms, such as through fossil fuel capitalism, neoliberal growth models, and hyper-consumptive lifestyles and desires, but also through all the structures and systems built and held in place by powerful alliances globally. Climate coloniality seeps through everyday life across space and time, weighing down and curtailing opportunities and poss possibilities through a toxic mix of global racisms, rapacious extractivism, colonial dispossessions, climate deaths, and patriarchy. Dominant discussions around climate tend to make climate change seem apolitical as a physical phenomenon to be fixed only with technology and finance, instead of a restructuring of relationships to ecologies, waters, lands, and communities that we are intimately, materially, and politically connected to. To decolonize is to reveal, reassess, and dismantle colonial structures and discourses, make them non-universal, dismantle the hegemony deployed historically and through particular racialized colonial practices and everyday tactics of oppression and empire building. Decolonizing climate, therefore, needs to tackle with the complexities of ongoing colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, and development in the reproduction of ongoing colonialities through existing global governance structures, discursive framings, material outcomes, and imagined futures. In the end, the terrors of colonialism foreclose various conditions of possibilities, of futurities, and flourishing that we will never know. Working through this pain and unknowing allows for healing and can promote formulating liberatory praxis. Coloniality has remade and continues to remake the past, the present, and the future of many peoples. We are altered, reconfigured, expendi expendable, but we are not passive agents in this despite constrained circumstances. We live, resist, rebuild, rejoice, and refuse, but we also feel sorrow for a fat past that never got to be, a present that is incomplete, unknowables that haunt and peak. These are the fertile ground, uh, grounds where colonial imperial wounds and resultant rage, grief, and fear are not minimized, but recognized as part of the driving forces of resurgence and liberation. One thing is clear, feeling, embodying, and experiencing the impacts of climate coloniality is a very steep price to pay for just knowing about it. <laughs>
However, speaking about it is an essential component in confronting it and pursuing decolonial futures of abundance and flourishing. Without pathologizing or objectifying those enduring climate coloniality, we need to be able to hear and heed their suffering, learn from their emotional embodied geographies of climate, while also registering and celebrating a multiplicity of voices, stories, ideas, cosmology, strengths, and convivialities, politics of indifference, discounting, silencing, ignoring, co-optation, and theft can no longer continue. This is important in dismantling climate coloniality for emancipatory futures. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Farhana. Um, really wonderful talk. Um, We'll move into our respondents now, uh, and we'll follow the order that's listed in the program. Uh, so our first respondent is Dr. Jennifer Rice uh, from the University of Georgia. Hi, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's such an honor to be a part of this amazing panel and a respondent for this important work. Thank you to the Journal of Political Geography for inviting me to join this fantastic group and to Dr. Sultana for the moving presentation. My students and I regularly turn to Dr. Sultana's work for guidance and inspiration. We use Dr. Sultana's work as theoretical framing, methodological insight, and most importantly, scholar ethics. So it's really an honor to engage with Dr. Sultana on this amazing piece, as well as the rest of the panelists. What Dr. Sultana has presented today and provided the panelists in advance as a paper is truly remarkable work. I do not take for granted the personal reflections and lived experiences provided and shared here what you call feeling with climate change. Thank you, Dr. Sultana, for giving us this important and I know challenging work. I hold closely and with care knowledge of the trauma, the heaviness that the coloniality of climate change causes and also your hopefulness for a decolonial climate future. I have read a lot of Dr. Sultana's work over the years, like many of you, I am sure, and this paper feels distinct. Building on a trajectory I have seen over the past few years, it is increasingly bold confrontational, direct, all in good and necessary ways. The presentation today is transformative. It is brave and powerful. The paper provides a clear vision for what happens when we stop coddling those with privilege. And as stated in the paper, demand, quote, a repoliticization of climate instead of the depoliticized techno-economist utopias that never deliver, end quote. In reflecting on what I might contribute to this conversation about climate justice, I start from my own commitment to learn with and from and not appropriate the experiences of coloniality, environmental racism, and climate disaster that are held by people and communities on the front lines of climate change. As such, what I love about the paper today is that Dr. Sultana challenges all of us, directly and without question, to do the real work of de decolonization. In the paper we were given, Dr. Sultana says, quote, it's not just about recognition of the problems, but the workings towards distributive justice, reparations, and restitution, end quote. I think you said that today too. In other words, Dr. Sultana tells us this is not a drill. I'm still working to do this well in my own work and life. In this effort, I with my colleagues, Josh Long and Anthony Lavenda, we've, pro we've proposed five political orientations for climate just justice in a book we're currently editing with UGA Press. These are totally in line with Dr. Sultana's reflections here and very much inspired by her work more generally. So I'll quote them from the book's introduction. One, abolish, race, abolish racist legal, carceral, and policing systems that criminalize those made precarious by climate change. Two, invest in low carbon public housing and other collective infrastructures that reject private property as the only means to climate mitigation or resilience. Three, pay reparations in the form of direct compensation to and investments in racialized and marginalized communities and nations who, have, who bear the brunt of, of carbon colonialism. Four, return land to indigenous communities and ban Western land grabs touted as mitigation and adaptation strategies. Five, center and care for black indigenous people of color, female and queer experiences and knowledges of climate adaptation and environmental restoration. These are some concrete demands with already existing visions for achieving them through many on the ground activist groups that require our full and immediate support, a call to action we heard here today. But perhaps most importantly, climate rage, as Dr. Sultana calls it, is here and only going to get worse if those in charge and with the most privilege continue to ignore the reality of climate colonialism. I take this morning seriously and know how Dr. Sultana's work will inspire others to do the same. 
Having said this, what is always so important about, uh, about Dr. Sultana's work is that it never forgets the potential of resistance and change, the importance of care and connection, which we heard about today. As Dr. Sultana wrote about climate rage, quote, sense of despair, suffocation, stagnation, abandonment, and regression coexist with that of potentiality of alternative personalities, possibilities of collectivi collectivizing, of world making, of critical hope, end quote. This is the move forward. And thank you, Dr. Sultana, for leading the way. I have already read this piece multiple times and I, and I will continue to engage with it. And I hope others will do the same. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. Our next uh, respondent uh, is Dr. DeAndre Smiles from the University of Victoria. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you, Farhana, for um, an absolutely wonderful paper and a wonderful talk. Um, I think that I am going to have a crick in my neck tonight from how many times I found myself nodding, um, both during reading your paper as well as listening to your talk. Um, I found particular resonance in so, so many things, um, and I, I believe I only have five minutes to respond, and so I will, I will do my best to um, work against my Anishinaabe teachings and, and keep my keep my loquaciousness to a, to a minimum here. One of the things that I, I teach about when I talk about um, anthropogenic climate change is the fact that it, in common discourse right now, it is only a crisis because settler colonial capitalist structures have deemed it so. Um, we, I, I use the, the discourse around the the supposed end of the world in 2012 at the end of the mayan calendar as an intervention right where all of a sudden settler culture became in insatiably obsessed with the end of the world and how it might happen and then i get reminded even a few years before that the uh, uh the, the the multitude of climate emergency centered movies that came out that oh, what would happen if temperatures lowered to a point where the world would freeze um and I tell my students that, um, you know, if you were to go to a indigenous community in the Great Lakes and say, you know, what do you think about the end of the world? Um, probably, uh, you know, a sweet old auntie would probably say, well, the end of the world has already happened for us, right? It has already happened. It has already come through land dispossession, through all of these violences that colonialism and capitalism has brought to us. And yet we're still here. Right, the end of the world has come for us. I, I think about um, Kyle White, who will be giving, uh, will be part of a, a plenary panel here on Sunday, I believe. Um, who, who I, I am inspired by. I mean, along the side the work of Dr. Sultana, right? That we, just because popular discourse says that the end of the world is here doesn't mean that we give up hope and that we we completely abandon um, strategies of resistance and resilience. That's have seen many cultures and many communities, both in North America here on Turtle Island, as well as in the global South um, through these processes. And so that was one thing that really kind of shone through to me. The, the second thing that kind of shines through to me and one thing, a provocation that I wanna make is we see similar discourses in academia. Um, we see that issues facing the global South, issues facing indigenous communities, black communities, uh, marginalized communities oftentimes do not get currency in academia unless a white global northern scholar decides that they want to study with the community and they want to go in there and then they become the ones that can speak for the community and present that work to the outside world. I want us to think really deeply about that because in this era of anthropogenic climate crisis, if we follow the, the line of reasoning that these marginalized communities, as Dr. Sultana says, have already faced these consequences and have managed to find these adaptive, resilient techniques in, in forms of activism and, and resilience and resurgence to deal with this, might it not be logical and reasonable for us to uplift those voices and to uplift the communities that are doing this work in the work that we do. It's been one of my uh, one of one of my bones of contention at the AAG annual meeting that's um, that it that the, the community communities oftentimes don't 
find their voices here at these large conferences, right? It, that we view ourselves as, as academics, and I speak about myself as well, because we Indigenous academics are not immune to this as well, as we are the interlocutors for this sort of thing. What would it look like for us when we are coming up with all of these strategies about kind of community engaged work and mitigation and adaptation, what would it look like to be able to turn that work over to the communities and make it possible, use our immense wealth and privilege and power to make it possible for those communities to do the work that is important for themselves? That's a central component of my research agenda going forward and the type of work that I wish to do with Indigenous communities. And while everybody is free to go, go about their work in the way that they make sense for them, that is something that I think is, is vitally important um, if we are to ever truly decolonize the academy, right, which if you were to ask folks like Eve, Eve Tuck and, and uh, Yang, right, they're, they're going to be ambivalent about that. But if we are to do that, we have to build a more horizontal power structure or even tilt it so that the communities are the ones that are helping to drive these, these processes that we, we seek to do here in our work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dantre. And our third respondent is Dr. Meredith Taboom, University of South Carolina. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sultana, and thank you to Political Geography for the opportunity to join this, discuss this discussion. The best scholarship is generative. Rather than defining once and for all what is, it opens possibilities for thinking and being otherwise, both as individuals and in, in community with others. Dr. Sultana, I'm inspired today by how your work opens up a limitless range of those otherwises. We each take something different from your words, something I think you're seeing in these responses, using them to reorient and move in new directions. You not only call us toward pluriversality, you create that world through the diversity of thought reflected in your own work, as well as in the work that you help to generate. These open possibilities admittedly make it a bit difficult to create a, a singular response. So given the limited time, I'll focus on your analysis of coloniality. Specifically, I want to consider the possibilities your work opens for understanding climate coloniality as violence. I'll conclude with a question that your work prompts for me and that haunts mine as well. What does an ethics of care and collectivity look like at a planetary scale? Your use of the term coloniality is both insightful and strategic here. Coloniality means different things, obviously, to different people, but I take inspiration from Fanon, who I know also inspires your own work, to approach it as a social relation of violence and division. By foregrounding coloniality, then, you call our attention to the relationality of violence. Violence is not only an outcome, but as a relation of power. Such relations, of course, don't merely happen. They are facilitated by climates of violence, simultaneously material and epistemic, as you so thoughtfully describe, that enable the devaluation and dehumanization of others. And this means, of course, that it is not enough to merely enact technical solutions to climate change or even to uproot oppressive economic and political structures. Ending coloniality requires nothing short of transforming human relations. Drawing on autoethnography and an encompassing review of scholarship and activism, your analysis locates the violence of coloniality in the empty promises of Eurocentric universalism. Such universalism, as you note, is also trenchant in the Anthropocene as a discourse, a planetary declaration that fails to account for the unevenness of climate change and which renders the world's marginalized majority disposable in the name of the accumulation for the few. I wonder then how we might also locate the violence of coloniality, not merely in universality, but in universalism disguised as division. After all, the Eurocentrism you rightfully called a task was a false Eurocentrism, a universalism only deemed universal for some, the type that led Hegel to declare Africans as a people apart from both humanity and history. For Fanon, it is this division, this disguising of universalism, this dis or I should say this disguising of division as universalism that is at the heart of colonial violence. In the early pages of Wretched of the Earth, he describes colonialism as a world cut in two, a world that forces the colonized into, quote, a zone of non-being, an incline stripped bare. It is, in other words, a world built on division, the violent splitting of life against itself. It reflects not universalism, but hierarchy disguised as universalism. Such division also lies, of course, at the heart of Achille Mbembe's necropolitics, which, which resonates so powerfully with your words today. Mbembe theorizes necropower as the capacity to dictate who may live and who must die. 
These two categories, like your work, are relational. The subject deems the other's death necessary for their own life. Necropolitics then is a divisive strategy through which violence in the name of false universalism is deemed legitimate. We can interpret climate coloniality as likewise founded upon such necropolitical strategies. The short-sighted attempted separation of capitalist growth from earthly limitations, of course, but also the division of life against itself, the treatment of both the conditions of life and of life itself as objects from which to extract ever more for ever fewer. This abstraction of life into commodity echoes the endless extraction you describe in your paper, abstraction and extraction as mutually constituted. But having recognized climate coloniality as relational violence, we are still left with the challenge of how to transcend it, the challenge that you call our attention to. How to enact the ethics of care and collectivity that you envision, how to reject the temptations that seek to splinter us apart. You outline many promising solutions, but it's also here that I think the autoethnography you foreground is at its most powerful. Drawing on your personal reflections on climate disaster, you characterize coloniality as an emptiness that feels unbearably heavy. Your words remind me again of Fanon, who describes violence as atmospheric, a metaphor that captures not only the violence of climate change, but the intertwined violence of racism and other forms of oppression, which target the very breath on which life relies. To transcend such coloniality requires, I think, an inversion of the Eurocentrism you rightly critique. Rather than a false universalism, it requires what Fanon describes as unity and diversity, a shared humanity in and of the world. Whereas coloniality is a violence of necrosis, a strategy of social debridement that fuels endless cycles of inversion, unity and diversity recognizes the fractal complexity of embodied experience that you have so thoughtfully detailed today. It also, however, recognizes a universality of mutual, mutuality, a universalism of mutuality, of not only being in the world, but being in the world with others. It calls us to resist the temptation to recreate coloniality in new forms, as is the case with nationalist violence, for example, and instead reject social debridement outright. I wonder if this radical mutuality, this universality of being in the world with others, might have resonance with the ethics of care and collectivity for which you call. For in recognizing the dignity of all life, in taking on a radical mutuality that defies division, we are, as Fanon himself so eloquently argued, doing nothing short of restructuring the world. Thank you, Dr. Sultana, for sharing your powerful scholarship and story today. And thank you as well for sharing your humanity. Yeah, thank you so much, Meredith. And we've done an absolutely incredible job of sticking to time. This is, I think, of AAG first. Um, so um, this thankfully leaves us uh, lots of time for uh, discussion, both for Dr. Sultana, Sultana uh, to respond uh, to the respondents' comments, and then for uh, questions and discussion with the, with the audience. Um, so uh, Dr. Sultana, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Kevin. Um, well, thank you, uh, Jennifer, DeAndre, and Meredith for such uh, generous um, and capacious responses um, and for such a, a kind reading of, of my work um, to set the context for uh, the people in the audience. This is work in progress. Uh, this is still a draft paper. So the panelists received a draft version a few weeks ago. Um, obviously, you find typos right after you send hit on an email. You find typos after you hit send on a draft. Um, but then also your work, your work is also filtered. It marinates. It germinates. Right. It, it becomes different ways of thinking about issues or different ways to think about the same issue, but in completely different ways. So in in the uh, work uh, that uh, uh, the panel and Kevin read, um, I, I, there's, it's a lot more going on, and I do have a lot more um, ethnographic material in there. So I think some of the issues that, um, um, Kevin, I'm going to borrow your word, is that it's a methodologically different type of paper for a political geography audience. Like, it is extremely um, brutal in its honesty, but it's also very confrontational. Um, and then what I try to do is um, in uh, kind of working through those, I was really fearful of being vulnerable and to critique and to how this is received. And I didn't know how the panelists would receive it. So thank you very much for such generous readings of my work and responding to it and, and showing how it resonates with you. But I think one of the things that struck me um, in going back through the different uh, bodies of work that I've read over time, but recognizing like words that I'd written, you know, when I was in high school and college, so that the piece that you heard, um, I also end with a, a different 
different vignette that I um, wrote in, I think, later in college. Um, so basically trying to figure out what does it mean to sit with these things and thoughts um, and what can we do? And to, you know, to what Meredith said that, yes, it is a kind of shared humanity and yet it is also very fractured. And what do we do with these kind of atmospheric suffocations or, you know, as Fanon talks about the violences that exist, it is not to shy away from. So what I was trying to do in the paper is to force the gaze, you know, forcing, forcibly keeping the eyes open because I think it's really easy um, for academics uh, to want to only celebrate the things that are positive. What I'm trying to do here is to show that we need to be able to talk about the not so positive to reconcile with the positive, you know, world making narratives, or as, you know, DeAndre mentioned, that what does it mean to highlight and elevate different voices, different types of expertise? That is something I tease out further um, in, in the actual paper and in the ongoing work. Um, just one last thing that I will mention is that I think it's really wonderful to think about the ways that different people respond to um, each other's work, but also to mine. So I'm, I'm just really grateful that people ever read my work at all. <laughs> um, so when I was invited to give this uh, plenary, I thought it was uh, possibly um, they sent it to the wrong person, <laughs> but it was like, addressed to me. And I was like, but I'm sorry, there's always like some powerful dude <laughs> from the US who gives these talks. Um, I'm not a political geographer, I'm an interlocutor, but my work speaks to political geography in many different ways. Um, and I think this is why a lot of people have a hard time identifying like, what kind of geographer is she? <laughs> I wear multiple hats. Um, so in terms of kind of thinking about, well, what can political geographers do with this? I think, um, and others in the audience um, or who may watch this video later on, my hope is that once the whole collection of essays um, and responses come out, that it makes sort of sense that you see resonances, that you see where your work fits and how it speaks to you to recognize that this collective world making that we hope for, we talk about, we end with, um, is kind of where I'm starting from. Like, yes, there are these signals and signifiers that operate in academia, but then what does it mean um, to do that actual work? It is hard. And so what I'm trying to do is to showcase that, yes, we can be vulnerable and we can be concerned. And yes, there are violences. So how do we do that without fetishizing, without pathologizing, without looking away? Um, it is really hard to do this kind of work sometimes. It is uh, deeply personal. Um, my concern was I would start bawling in the middle of <laughs> talking today, um, but I kind of managed to rein it in. And uh, and it's okay to recognize those kinds of the, uh, the um, I guess, the affective registers of this kind of climate uh, coloniality. So I'm basically theorizing this from that lived experiences rather than theorizing vulnerability from that kind of reductionist or resiliency from that uh, disembodied, you know, de depopulated uh, kind of theoretical spaces or to fetishize people for being resilient. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm so tired of being resilient my entire life. So um, it, it, that's that's just my hope that, you know, at, at some point that we can start to have these kinds of conversations and elevate those voices and hear from folks who have been kind of silenced, but then also decenter the forms of knowledge that we have been conditioned to. It has taken me personally some time to kind of decondition that mentality, right? Like through if you go to college in the U.S., if you're from another country and you come to college or graduate school in the U.S., you are, or, or even in school, wherever you may be, the, that universality of Eurocentric knowledge production um, is very uh, global right now. And that is what I'm trying to push back against. Um, and I know a lot of indigenous communities around the world are doing that. Indigenous science is trying to do that and calling forth what is science. It's not only Eurocentric science that matters, um, but also the different forms of, of knowledge production. I um, mean, I think one of the things that I'll just end with here is that we need to be brave. And this is not something easy to do in academia because there are different forms of judgment, um, evaluation, assessment, discarding, and uh, uh, demotion, or rather absolute discard, right? People are pushed out of the academy. Um, and the way I think I've approached this is, 
um, you know, being, we talk about like how for a lot of women of color being silent was never an option. And yet a lot of people, a lot of people are silenced. So it's, a, it's not a uh, issue about people being voiceless, people being ch uh, choosing to have different voices in different spaces, but also about being heard. So it's, it is about us hearing doing that work. So um, I've tried to be brave in all my work, irrespective of how it's read uh, the you know, what renditions it results in, how it's interpreted, what kind of valuation it has, what assessments it has. Um, and that is trying to be authentic. That is also the form of decolonization of the for that cognitive justice. And it is a lifelong struggle. It is not a point of arrival, right? It is continual. It is happening right now. It'll happen with, with future work. Um, so, I, you know, as I try to weave in the kind of theories, the empirics, the emotions, the storytelling, the autoethnography with the high theory and the jargon, um, what does that do? And, and it is it is hard work, but I still invite everyone um, to do the hard work because otherwise we're going to be having the same conversations 100 years from now. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Sultana. That's an excellent kind of uh, take home point there. Um, we have some time now for uh, sort of questions, comments, uh, responses from uh, folks in the audience. I think um, it's set so that you can uh, you're able to unmute yourself if you do have um, a question or something like that. I think maybe we could start off with maybe um, seeing how much seeing how many questions there are. I think if yeah we might be able to raise hands or something like that. I'm not sure if that's features available here on this, but if we are, if not, just unmute yourself and we can uh, yeah we'll take some questions. Maybe I've bored everyone into silence. <laughs> well, that's a first. Well, I think um, one question that I think sort of came to mind is, oh, is something that um, I would say as well, too, that uh, I think you know we can uh, post questions to the chat as well, um, if, if folks would prefer that, too. Um, but you know, I think a question of mine that came to mind, you know, sort of for me reading the paper and listening to the talk, I think, you know, um, you know, the methodological challenge um, that you draw out is, I think, you know, a really kind of uh, significant one. And it cuts, um, you know, kind of, you know, it really sort of pushes back against a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of conventional ways that we think about the practice of doing research, you know, not just, you know, sort of, you know, writing up and publishing, but, you know, the wider sort of practice of what it means to, you know, sort of engage with, um, with, with, you know, sort of, with, uh, you know, sort of impacted communities, with marginalized communities who are on the front lines. Um, and I like, you know, I really like the term of forcing the gaze. Um, and I think that's an incredibly important kind of like methodological, um, you know, sort of, you know, di you know, it's a, a very important methodological term. Um, so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about you know, kind of how you might think about, you know, what does it mean to force the gaze um, in the wider sort of scope of research practice, like, you know, not just in how we write up and, you know, sort of share results, but in, the, you know, sort of the research design process and, you know, the, the wider, the right, wider work that shapes our ability to do research. Uh, all right. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I, the panelists are welcome to join in, so I'll just keep it really brief. Um, so funny enough, I'm teaching our mandatory graduate uh, research design course in our department, which is a um, required course for all first year masters and PhD students. Uh, this is my first time teaching an entire course on research design, so it was a lot of work getting it off the ground. But what I did was I absolutely tossed out previous versions of the syllabus and rebuilt my own over Christmas break and did it the way I would want students to both learn conventional stuff to succeed in a program, but then also in very subtle or what I call subversive pedagogy to start to decolonize <laughs> what, what they learn and how what pedagogy is. Um, and I think one of the ways uh, there are many, there, there are many, many uh, different kinds of publications out there that people can access. Um, there's many from, uh, from Canada and the US, for instance, if you want, you can look up um, uh, I think it's called, is it Indigenous Methodologies by Linda Tuhiwai-Smith? Uh, there's others from, uh, gosh, I can't 
I can't remember the scholar's name uh, from Africa. Uh, but, but, you know, if you read across and what I call read across our own hemispheric biases or not being hamstrung by the context in which we work. So my empirical work on climate adaptation, climate justice is based in South Asia, but you'll notice that the scholars I cited, right, are largely decolonial, anti-colonial, and anti-race scholars from, uh, you know, Latin America, North America, and Africa. It, it is getting past the context in which we work. Um, and uh, so one of the things that is really important, I think, to think about in terms of research uh, design um, is to think about how um, we not just do the work in terms of methods and methodology, but it, it, to uh, answer very briefly Kevin's question about, uh, what was the question? I think it was largely about the research design in our own work. So one of them would be first read broadly, read deeply, read widely, think about your research design, your methodology, how you're doing it. But then whose voice are you centering, right? Um, who are we working with instead of working for? Um, how do we see resonances and valences across different communities um, so it is not just uh, an isolation? So, so a lot of my work speaks to a lot of Indigenous scholarship, um, you know, in North America, as it does with Indigenous scholarship in Africa, because my work is drawing from, you know, um, indigenous communities in South Asia. So we're trying to look at these similarities, but then also um, not just pe communities uh, who are indigenous to an area, but people who are working with uh, those scholars. They could be from other places, uh, other communities. In terms of thinking about uh, the voices we elevate, the voices we uh, center, but then how we decenter ourselves as researchers um, and be very careful about the silences, not just silences in the archive, but silences in in our work in terms of you know silences that we find or how our work our work is never going to be complete right it's not an end all be all it's not going to do everything in one go it's always a becoming it is always growing and, and germinating but in that moment in time when it has to be finite whether it's a degree um, an article a book whichever it is how does what does completion mean in terms of what is that what has it centered and what has it decentered what has it uh, opened possibilities or doors for um you know how has it pulled together different things um and in what ways um has it challenged conventional um, epistemic uh, valuations and valorizations and i think these are some of the ways that we can actually start to think about those kind of material praxis of solidarity that are not just those, you know, that uncritical celebration that, that I was mentioning that I detail further in the paper. In terms of what do we do with um, not just hearing about how people are adapting or what they're doing in this place or what their struggle is, but what are the different registers of that struggle? It doesn't necessarily mean showing up at a protest, right? His struggles and resistance and opposition can exist in very different ways. Um, how do people talk about, um, so in this autoethnography, for example, that you read, um, that I read out loud, one of the small vignettes for, there's another one at the end of the paper that, you know, that talks about like, what is this heaviness? That the title of the paper, sure, it is a riff on Milan Fundera's work, but it is coming from that much older entry that I wrote decades ago about the, this emptiness feeling heavy. So it's this heaviness, it's an unbearable heaviness, and it continues, it carries, it becomes light sometimes, and sometimes it becomes heavier. How do other people experience those forms of, you know, erasure or co-optation or dispossession or displacement or degradation? Um, and then at the same time, recognizing who are the local elites versus non-elites, um, how do these things uh, resonate across scales, across communities, across institutions. Um, but I, I, I'll just conclude here, but in terms of thinking about what does it mean to shoulder those kinds of burdens, those emotional griefs or traumas or suffering, um, to, so that it is not just housed and inhabited within spatial, the temporal registers within certain embodiments, but what does it mean to help elevate certain voices, which sometimes means silencing ourselves? Yeah, thank you so much for that um, for that comment. Um, so, oh, yes, um, we have a question from <laughs> yeah, we have a question from uh, Diana Lieberman, um, whose dog is barking. I, I feel your pain on that. My dog does the same uh, whenever I'm on Zoom as well. 
Um, so Shreds, thank you for the important talk for Hana. As you know, some of our colleagues in the last couple of 24 seven days trying to get government approval for IPCC report on impacts, vulnerability and adaptation. A range of critical and geographic voices is trying to get issues of climate justice into the report and summary for policymakers, including loss and damage, embodied experience, gender, et cetera. While we will probably see many silences in the report and should highlight them, should we also celebrate the extent to which IPCC might be making tentative steps to anti-colonial decolonial analysis and knowledge? So thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Diana, thank you for this. Um, and thank you for the work you're doing with um, IPCC. I, a lot of people I know who would like to have been here today are, can't be because they're so busy with the IPCC media report because the report's coming out on Monday. Um, I think it is important to recognize that, that you, in a global governance structure like this, that is resistant to change and, and challenge, right? Um, that's one of the scales at which um, I talk about in the paper. The fact that it's these kinds of conversations are happening uh, means that A, it's been a change in personnel, it's been a change in epistemologies, right? Um, but it's also in terms of different valuations of different kinds of knowledges and expertise. So I think it could be, we could see these as very tentative steps, but at the same time recognize that you know the UNFCC, the IPCC reports, um, you know, are um, make guidelines and help clarify certain knowledges. But at the end of the day, do governments act on it? Right? Do they? Do people give it uh, valence, or do people give it the kind of valuation? And I think that's where the challenge is. Yes, it is important. IPCC is doing this because it's absolutely critical to come from that level of expertise and that high up in terms of global uh, system, um, a global international body. Um, in 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 terms of knowledge production, but at the same time, recognize that there's so much more work needs to be done in terms of pushing for that to happen and filter down across scales. Um, because for instance, at the COP26, the fossil fuel lobby was the largest lobby at the COP26, you know, three months ago. So what do we do with that? Like, how do we uh, make sure that various discourses are not being co-opted? Because they are, there's so much greenwashing going on and the whole net zero nonsense, right? The whole kind of climate justice as a term has been so co-opted by the fossil fuel lobby, by various forms of very powerful people who are also claiming various subalternal ideal um, I, um, positionings and identities to claim to speak for their people. So you need to be really careful about that and then constantly push back um, and use our, what I call the, our relational privileges. All of us have various relational privileges. We do what we can from where we are with what we have at that point in time. So how do we use our relational privileges at that time with what we have and how we can to be brave? to demand these changes. If the IPCC can introduce that kind of language, what does it need, to, what needs to happen for follow through in changes in policies and allocation of personnel and allocation of budgetary financial resources, right? In terms of institutional reconfiguring and accountability and transparency. Sorry, that was really fast and I talked really fast. <laughs> no, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this takes us um, through uh, our end time of uh, 322. Um, so, well, I would love to, uh, well, yeah, well, I'd love to continue the conversation. We do have to close out the room so everyone can get on with their next uh, sessions. So again, a big thank you um, to our respondents, Jennifer Rice, Dondra Smiles, Meredith Boone, and of course, a very uh, big thank you uh, to Dr. Farhana Satana for this wonderful plenary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone to, uh, staying through to the end. And thank you to Jennifer, Meredith, and DeAndre for lovely comments and to Kevin for inviting me and organizing this session. That in itself is foresight in some way, right? <laughs> Political geography. <laughs> thank you, everyone.